In this video, I'm going to share with you 11 tips for your Hawaii vacation winter edition. For more Hawaii videos, make sure you're subscribed and click that notification bell so you're alerted every time we post a new video. Aloha, I'm Miriam and this is Yes to Hawaii. We make Hawaii videos take the guesswork out of planning your trip. As always, I'll leave timestamps in the description box below so feel free to skip around the video for the parts that you came here for. If you're new here, hi, I'm Miriam. I work full-time as a concierge here in Waikiki and I make Hawaii videos take the guesswork out of planning your trip. From here, I'll refer to the winter season as the months of December, January, and February. Let's get into it. Over the past few weeks, I've actually heard quite a few of these horror stories happen here in Waikiki so I wanted to make this video to share this with you so it doesn't happen to you on your vacation. Tip number one, holiday hours and weekend hours are important to note. In general, it's always best to book any tours or excursions early. And the reason for this is a lot of tours and activities will typically cut off their manifests the day before if there's an early morning pickup. So for example, if there's a island tour with a pickup at 8.15, it's highly unlikely that at eight o'clock, you'll be able to come to your concierge desk to book a tour to leave for 8.15. Similarly, concierge desk hours and tour company hours are not the same. So for example, your hotel concierge desk may be open 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. 365 days a year. The reservations desk that the concierge is calling to make your reservations may not have the same hours. Some tour companies close early on the weekend, so if your concierge is trying to call to make a reservation, even though he or she may be there in front of you, the reservations desk, which is who that person is trying to call, may already be closed. This is important to note if you've left booking your tours to the very last minute. Although that person may want to help you, they're unable to make those next day bookings simply because the reservations desk is already closed. Some vendors also have different hours and days that they're open. The Polynesian Cultural Center, for example, is closed on Sunday and their reservations desk is also closed on Sundays. Because every company has their own hours, this is why I recommend to book any tours, excursions, or activities early. This will give you the most flexibility and options to do whatever it is that you want to do. Tip number two, know that the time for sunset is earlier this time of year. In December, January, and February, sunset times are earlier, typically around 5.45, 6 o'clock, or 6.15. In summer months, for example, in July, by comparison, the sunset time is closer to 7.15. So why is this important? If you're booking a sunset dinner at a beautiful oceanfront restaurant, excited to see those turquoise blue waters, but you've made your reservation for 7 p.m. in December, you won't see anything, it'll be pitch black. For winter season, December, January, and February, I highly recommend that if you're planning on booking a sunset dinner and you want to see those ocean views, book it for an earlier time, closer to 5 or 5.30. A perk to an earlier dinner time, in addition to seeing those gorgeous views, is that most restaurants will often have a happy hour, for example, for reduced price appetizers or beverages. Similarly, if you're out hiking, you want to make sure to hike earlier in the day. Morning is best. You always want to hike with a buddy and you want to avoid starting hikes later in the afternoon, especially this time of year. Starting a hike in the late afternoon on a long, unfamiliar trail, especially when sunset is earlier, could mean that it will get dark while you're on the trail. Again, hiking is best done in the morning when there's plenty of daylight. Tip number three, know that winter season is actually our rainy season, so plan ahead for any tours or activities. In December, January, and February, it is our rainy season, so we will get more rain than we do in the summer months. However, it doesn't rain all the time. The rain is something you'll want to take into account if you're doing activities such as hiking. For example, before you do a hike, you might want to check what the weather was a couple days before the hike to see if the trail will be dry enough. So for example, let's say you want to do Monowilly Falls and it rained on Monday and Tuesday, for example. It's probably not the best idea to do the hike on Wednesday when the trail will most likely be muddier than normal. It might make more sense to wait it out till Thursday or maybe Friday if you have that flexibility. That way the trail isn't as muddy. Now, for most people, this might not matter, but if you're hiking a different trail or perhaps hiking with children, it might make more sense to be more cognizant of the weather and how it affects hiking trails. Similar if you have weather dependent activities, I definitely recommend booking those earlier in your stay rather than waiting to the very last few days. For example, most luau's are 100% outdoors and weather dependent. So for example, you're here for a week. It might make more sense to schedule your luau 
perhaps the third or fourth day that you're here, rather than waiting till the very night before you depart. This way, on the off chance that your luau gets canceled because of rain, you have a few more days that you can reschedule the activity. But if you leave it for the very last night of your stay and it gets canceled due to weather, you'll get refunded most likely, but you won't get to go. However, not to be a complete dream crusher, just because your activity cancels due to weather, it doesn't mean you're automatically rescheduled. Typically, you'll be rescheduled as long as there's space. A good example of this is the old Lahaina Luau on Maui. It books up months in advance. So if the week that you're here, the Luau cancels because of rain, unfortunately, if they don't have any space for reservations for the next month or two, you'll get refunded. You just won't get rescheduled. So for this reason, it's always good to have a couple backup activities just in case your first choice activity cancels. Tip number four is to book ahead, especially if you're traveling with a large group or family. December and January holidays can typically be busier, as you can tell, with the increase in room rates. I'll often see family reunions where guests will come to Hawaii as a main meeting point from different states or different countries to celebrate Christmas here on the island. If you're four or five families traveling together, for example, making a group of say 20, 25 people, definitely make sure to book your activities ahead. A really good example of this is the Hollywood Movie Sites Tour at Kualoa Ranch. Let's say you wait until a few days before you want to do the activity, but unfortunately they don't have space for a group of 20 to do the Hollywood Movie Sites Tour. Yes, you might still be able to do the tour, but you'd probably have to split up. So five people at the nine o'clock tour time, four people at the 10 o'clock tour time, and so forth. If you want to be in the same tour group together, the best course of action is to always book early. Again, I'll say it once and I'll say it again, booking early gives you the most flexibility especially if you're traveling with a large group or family. Similarly, at Kulo Ranch, for example, if you wanted to do two different tours there, if you book early and you book ahead, you have more flexibility in the wait time. So for example, let's say you have a tour that you want to do at nine o'clock in the morning, and there's another tour that you want to do, and it's at 11 o'clock in the morning. That back-to-back -back timing works out best, so there's minimal wait time for you in between tours. But if you wait till closer to the day of the activity, Maybe those two tours only have availability at vastly different times. So for example, the Hollywood movie size tour may be available at nine o'clock, but the zip line that you want to do isn't available until two o'clock. That means a four or five hour wait time in between tours. So you can still do the tours that you want to do perhaps, but the wait time will vary wildly. So again, book ahead, book early, give yourself the most flexibility to do the best activities that you want to do in your first choice dates and times. Tip number five is to know that there have been changes over the past few years. The most common question that I get asked at least a few times a day is how to get to Diamond Head Crater. Now the very next question I ask when someone asks me how to get to Diamond Head Crater, which is a hiking trail, is what time is your reservation for? Half of the time I'll get the same response where guests will tell me that they didn't realize they had to have a reservation because in the past they didn't have to. Now early in 2022 you didn't need a reservation to get to Diamond Head Crater. You would just walk in anytime between 6 a.m. and 4, pay the one dollar admission or five dollars for parking, and that was that. However, as of May 2022, there is now a 100% online reservation system. You go on the state's website, pick the date you wanna go, it'll show you a list of available times, you'll pay the state $5 for entry or $10 for parking if you need parking as well. And from there, you'll get a confirmation email and that's what you show the box office at the arrival. The system is really smart. It better manages trail capacity. And if you think about it, if you have hundreds of people who are paying cash to get inside Diamond Head Crater, imagine the wait times. Not too long ago, you could also do credit card only, but even that there was a wait time for the kiosk. Now with this, everyone prepays ahead of time. All they have to do is show their confirmation email when they get to the check-in office. Early morning time slots book out the fastest. 6 a.m., 7 a.m., 8 a.m., those are the most popular. While you can do the hike later in the day, keep in mind that the hike doesn't have any shade at all. So choosing to hike at 12 p.m. or 1 p.m. is typically the hottest times of the day. If you're a Hawaii resident and you have a Hawaii state ID or driver's license, you don't need to pay for the reservation and you can just go. Tip number six, plan to arrive early if you're trying to visit North Shore. This advice is particularly useful if there's a surf competition going on. Typically when there's surf competitions going on, parking at the beach parks is free, but because it's free and because it's limited, you could be circling for quite a while looking for parking. If seeing the big wave surf is something that is important to you, make sure to give yourself a little bit of buffer time to actually find parking on the day that you want to go. Tip number seven is to double check and know where your activity or tour is in advance. I met someone the other day who had booked a North Shore zip line and unfortunately did not notice that their ticket did not include any transportation, they hadn't booked a rental car, 
and from Waikiki, this particular zip line was about an hour to an hour and a half drive away. Their check-in was at 10 o'clock, their tour started at 10.30, and by the time they were in front of me, it was already 9.45. Even though they rushed, it's very unlikely that they made the check-in time. Speaking of North Shore zip lines, you can also check out this video if you're curious about it. I've already made a video on the North Shore zip line, and spoiler, I really liked it. Tip number eight is to give yourself ample time to get to any tour activity, excursion, check-in, Anything that you need, always give yourselves ample time. I myself was driving to a zip line over on Maui. I had missed the turn where you're supposed to turn left to check in. I had to drive about three to four miles down the road before I found a good place that I could turn around at. Luckily, as always, I always give myself an extra 15 to 30 minutes ahead of time for any check-ins so I wasn't rushed. However, if you literally only go from the time that's given at Google Maps, this could be a stickler point, especially if you miss a turn. Now, traffic is a very real thing on Oahu. And if you've been to the neighbor islands, you'll notice a marked difference in traffic on Oahu compared to Maui, Big Island, or Kauai. Oahu, for example, is quite a bit smaller than Maui, and it has a million people compared to Maui's 150,000. More people, more cars on the road, more traffic. Now, for example, the North Shore zip line that I had mentioned earlier, the distance from Haleiwa Town to that zip line is maybe only 15 miles, and Google Maps might list it as 30 minutes to drive. However, because I'm familiar with that area, I know to always give myself an extra 10 to 15 minutes just in case of any road work. Parking is also something to take into account. For example, if you're on Oahu and you're doing a snorkel boat tour, and your check-in point is at Kualo Basin Harbor. Yes, it's only about four miles or a 15 minute drive from Waikiki. However, parking at that harbor is limited. So if you're doing an early morning tour or perhaps a sunset tour, give yourself a little bit of extra time just in case the main parking lot is full and you have to drive around a little bit to look for parking. Oftentimes for these kind of boat trips, if you miss your check-in or you literally miss the boat, they typically won't refund you. Tip number nine is to check to see if whatever activity you've booked includes transportation. Oftentimes, if transportation is available at a low cost, it's typically going to be a lot cheaper than if you were to get a taxi, Uber, Lyft, or a rental car, depending on what time of year you're here on the island. For example, the other day, I had somebody who had booked the Polynesian Cultural Center from home, and they had come down to the desk around 9.30 in the morning. Unfortunately, the pickup for Polynesian Cultural Center was at 10.30 in the morning, and they thought they could jump on that shuttle. However, unfortunately, the shuttles were full. There were no other options to get to the center other than taxi, Uber, or Lyft. It was too hard to find a rental car for them and they didn't want to drive even if they found a car. The cost from Waikiki to Polynesian Cultural Center by taxi is probably about a hundred or so dollars. Uber and Lyft, I would probably ballpark it the same depending on traffic. However, the Polynesian Cultural Center's own shuttle service only charges $25 per person round trip. If you're a solo traveler or two people, paying $50 for round trip shuttle service is gonna be significantly less than having to rent a car, pay for gas, pay for insurance, pay for potentially the parking or valet at your hotel to keep the car overnight when you return and all the time spent driving. This is something to make note of and to make sure you double check with all the activities that you do. Some will include transportation for free, some will include them at a cost and some do not include transportation. For the ones that don't, it's always a good idea to double check how far away it is from where you're staying in Waikiki or other parts of the island to see if Uber, Lyft, a taxi service or any of those options work for you or if a rental car would indeed make the most sense. Tip number 10 is that a rental car can often be a good deal if you're traveling with a larger family or group. And this can be true if you're using your rental car not only as transportation to and from the activity, but to do other things as well. So for the North Shore zipline that I mentioned earlier in the video, getting a rental car to get to the zipline might make the most sense because on the way to the zipline, you can also check out the Dole Pineapple Plantation. You can explore Haleiwa Town. You can go into Waimea Valley Botanical Garden and of course, check out the rest of the North Shore. If you're coupling a rental car with other things that you can do around the island, such as a little bit of sightseeing in addition to your activity, it might make more sense and give you a better value. Tip number 11 is to always have backup transportation. Know that Uber and Lyft is pretty reliable in the Waikiki area and downtown Honolulu. Waikiki has the highest concentration of hotels, so typically it's easy to get an Uber Lyft from Waikiki elsewhere on the island. However, keep in mind that Uber and Lyft are people just like you or I. So if there aren't any drivers in that specific area where you are, you're kind of stuck. The same can be said for specific times. Over Halloween, there was an event called Hullabaloo in Chinatown. So for this specific event, Uber or Lyft, it would normally cost about $20 to get from Chinatown to Waikiki. However, for this specific event, because of surge pricing and less drivers, more demand, it would have cost $60 to go just about five miles. Now, surge pricing isn't something that's unique to Hawaii. It can happen in many cities depending on the demand of drivers. The cab is a popular taxi service and their phone number is easy to remember. Area code is 
and their phone number is 422-2222. Their dispatch is 24 seven. So if you did take an Uber or Lyft somewhere and there aren't any Uber or Lyfts in the area to get you back to your hotel, you can always call their 24 hour dispatch service to get a taxi sent to where you are so you aren't stuck. If you're staying at a hotel instead of an Airbnb, I would also recommend chatting with their bill desk to get the phone numbers for taxi services that they recommend. It's always best to have a couple taxi phone numbers in your phone saved just in case Uber and Lyft does not go through. Nine times out of 10, it'll be easy to get an Uber or Lyft. However, it takes an extra two minutes to just get those extra taxi phone numbers and having them in your phone can give you peace of mind, especially if you're going outside of Waikiki or if you're concerned on getting a ride back into Waikiki.